On this episode of Star Trek Universe, Matt and I will be discussing Strange New Worlds 110, A Quality of Mercy, the season one finale, right after these words from our mystery sponsors. Welcome to Star Trek Universe, the podcast where you get to listen in on two lifelong friends talk about Star Trek. My name is Matthew Carroll. I'm David C. Robertson. Well, David C. Robertson. Yes, sir. Matthew Scott Carroll. How be your <laughs> evening? Uh, sucky. Oh, no. Uh, <laughs> I'm under the weather. I'm a little sick. And I don't, I'm really hoping it's just a, a sinus infection and not some sort of weird COVID situation. Right. I don't yeah, I hope think so too, it man. would be, but because I just, I, I've been cleaning out this, uh, this old lady's house, you know? Yeah. Probably just dust and stuff, man. Yeah. I think that's probably what, what's happened. Mm. Well, I'm sorry. I'm sorry you're feeling it's bad. It's okay. It's all right. But we'll we'll make quick work of this here Strange New Worlds episode. Quick work. Every time we say it's going to be quick, it's like a three hour episode. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, what what do you think? I, I I really don't know how you're going to feel about this episode. Let me just like lay out. Really? How, yeah, because it's. I mean, I, I think it's a super neat idea. Uh huh. I love what's happening here. I love getting to see. Like we always talk about the differences in the captains. But how cool is it to watch Pike get to make the same decisions that Kirk got to make Mm. and see how they operate differently and Mm. get given the same information? Like, what are they, what, what, what changes would Pike make that Kirk wouldn't have done? Like, it's just really, really a cool thing. Um, it, it obviously pays a lot of respect to, uh, Kirk because, I mean, Kirk is, Kirk, intuition and aggressiveness like wins the day while pike's sort of thoughtfulness and empathy ends up Mm -hmm. you know while while it seems like it it, it's it's truly like seems like the right thing to do in many ways like the more starfleet thing to do um but i think that that that's where it falls apart like these they aren't fighting uh, they're fighting a race like starfleet they're fighting someone that needs to needs a punch in the nose you know Right. Um, and I, I just, I just think it's a great episode for that reason. I think it's great. So I, I, I could see you loving this cause it's such a love letter to balance of terror, but uh-huh. it's also the most obvious that none of that, like uh, th- th- that it feels like it's in a different timeline because we're literally watching the same stuff happen, but it, everything looks different. Yeah, none of that was <laughs> none of that surprised me in any way. Like, right? I have long said they're not like the, the people who are like, well, we still have you know ten years or seven years or however many years to uh, to afford to look like the original series. And uh, I've always said that doesn't make any sense at all. Like the cage looked like the 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 way it looked on the Enterprise on the cage was very close to the way it looked like on the second pilot with Kirk. Right, sure. you know, like they're 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 not going to go to like super techie and then you know back. That doesn't make a lot of, uh, yeah. So whatever, however you want to head cannon it for whatever reason, this is the the reality we're in. So that didn't surprise me or bother me. Right. Um, I I really liked this episode. Uh, I thought it was super cool. I you know as a fan artist, I am so annoyed. That they have taken the uh, the maroon uniform from the movies and put that damn Delta pattern on the sleeves because that <laughs> shit is meticulous and I will never draw those uniforms. <laughs> <laughs> so you didn't mind it, the look of it. You just hated the idea of having to try to draw it. Yeah, yeah, yeah a little I get bit. that. Um, I, I didn't even notice it was Delta pattern, honestly. And now that you're saying, I'm I'm literally looking at the screen right now, watching uh, it in the background, and I'm I've never noticed his deltas. So. The guy who's like just looking at your fan art when you post it, like you could probably just put a little, put a little hatching in there or something, <laughs> just give, <laughs> give it a little texture, you know, because that's yeah. all it looks like to me. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. Uh, so I, uh, I have questions about this episode. You know, we we find out that uh, this is seven years uh, in the future, mm-hmm. and previously on Strange New Worlds, Pike said. 10 years in 10 years, he was going to be 
disabled or he actually keeps saying dead which seems a little labelless to me but yes that's what i said the first episode we were talking about yeah. that <laughs> but yeah uh i mean yeah but the fact that they keep doing it makes me feel weird now though because <laughs> i'm like yes it's the it's the end of his life as he knows it yeah that's what you told me but i was like no i think he just said dead but yeah it's it's, it's, uh, it's funny it's really funny it's, and, and so weird. like the more they say it the more i feel weird about it <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's like, like eh. this is no slip of the tongue uh this is a thing they're sticking with so I mean, I, I know you say you hate the hate the red hatching or whatever, but like, man, I oh love, yeah, I'm just playing. I, I love <laughs> seeing that uniform show up. Yeah, the the maroon monster. Man. Yeah, they do a great job aging him up and the, him being in that uniform. Man, it's just like knowing that he's never going to make it to there, you know, and it's or you know, n- not as he knows it. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, he's convinced me he's gonna die (laughs) right well the only thing he doesn't know is that in apparently like like i don't know six months time after his accident he's gonna like be restored mentally on talos 4 and have sex with Vina for the rest of his life. Yeah. And ride his horse. <laughs> I don't know. That's what he did in the cage. Yeah. He yeah, just yeah. had a picnic and he had, he's like my horse. Like, yeah. That is a strange dramatic irony that we're watching a show that for seven years, we're going to watch a guy mentally break down about how horrible his life is going to be after that yeah. point. But we all know he's going to get to like go to Valhalla, you know, right. <laughs> that's, that's the hope that is star Trek. like you're gonna get to go have imaginary sex with a deformed frankenstein lady on talos 4 Mm -hmm. and ride a horse that doesn't actually exist you are in the nexus that's like that's why i'm like in 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 generations i'm so annoyed with kirk and picard because i'm like you guys are like screw the nexus it isn't real but like but okay that's fine for pike that's a great ending for Pike. He's still like, you know, jizzing it up over here and on Talos four while aliens watch him do it. But <laughs> in complete privacy, living out any lifetime they want to live out. No, mm-hmm. that we can't do the Nexus. The net well, we are real Starfleet captains. Well, 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 hold on. <laughs> this is a is a difference between their their two their ability is to, to continue their work. You know what I mean? Yeah. The Pike's thing was a consolation prize. I get it. Yeah. yeah. Like they, well, it's, it's a, I can't be effective anymore. Yeah. In in the role that I love, he thinks he's going to be locked in a chair for the rest of his life. And it's, it's a, it's a wonderful mercy to, it's, yeah. it's the Wesley saying lie to me now. Right. You know, from angel. Yeah. It's, it's that, it's that. No, I know. Interesting portrayal of Kirk. What did you think of the Kirk? Um, before I say that, I will say I loved this episode. <laughs> okay, okay. So I'm so I've apparently hit on the negatives for you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I hated this Kirk. He did not look, sound, act in no way like James Kirk. And it's not that I'm hung up on Shatner because I thought Chris Pine. Yeah, I thought Chris is, Pine was amazing. Chris Pine is wonderful in the role. Uh, you know what's funny to me about this whole thing? Well, what's that? Sam feels like Chris Pine's Kirk to me. Yeah. See, see that's what me and Bethany were saying. Yeah. It was like, uh, they sh- almost should have like, dude, we had precedence for it. Okay. Just make the guy that plays Sam play Kirk. It oh. would have been better. Oh, it's not the same guy. No. Okay. I legit didn't know. You I'm, thought it was the same guy? I'm very bad with faces. I thought he like okay. was, dr- and, and, and the mustache being gone yeah. can totally transform a face for me. Yeah. I, I legit think I have like a, f- a mild form of face blindness. Yeah. I have to know someone really well to recognize their face. Yeah. Like it takes me a long time. And so when I saw him show up, I thought that's what they were doing when they introduced Sam, Sam Kirk is that they oh, were okay. introducing us to the actor because you know, the same actor played both. Oh, yeah, Shatner was yeah both Sam. So I, I thought eventually when he would show up, I've been looking for when he showed up for it to be the same actor, but then yeah, his, his was portrayal was so much different than, you know, it almost felt like an insult to Chris Pine to me because uh-huh. they get, they've introduced these two Kirks now and <laughs> Sam Kirk is being played for laughs. Like that's all they, they treat him like a joke. And he, a little bit. to me, he is so 
Chris Pine. Like he's got the kind of frenetic energy, like the younger, like hey, yeah. like uh, I don't know the way he the way he laughs. So he, but I agree with you. I think his he's pulling off Kirk better than this than this Kirk is. Yeah, this, this Paul Wesley. Yeah, I, I, you know, I'm sure Paul Wesley is a nice guy. I, I have I've seen clips of him in other shows, and he did a fine job. I'm just not feeling Kirk from him at all in any way yeah and he actually like he felt more like a real estate agent than a starfleet captain didn't he like i i kept expecting him to try to sell a house to pike you know like Mm. i I didn't didn't think it was that bad i did he's like phil dunphy over here man (laughs) he does look like that guy and Um, his voice he sounds like chris hansen from to catch a predator (laughs) he's like he goes in to see chris uh you know pike he's like what are you doing here today are you aware that this Romulan commander you've been messaging is 14 years old? <laughs> that's not only treason, that's pedophilia, master. So, uh, you sent him a picture that you referred to as your tiny pike. <laughs> you offered to show him something you call the turnpike. <laughs> so wrong. It's so, sounds, I, I did, sounds like a, I, I didn't get that. <laughs> It didn't bother me, but I, I agree with you. It did not resonate no. as C- Captain Kirk to me like Chris Pine did. Right. Um, yeah. Chris Pine pulled it off. Even after the first outing, I was like, I feel like you are Kirk. Uh, this does not feel that way. And I I don't know exactly why. I think it is a little bit of like, there's just no sm- no smile behind his eyes. And like I feel like Kirk always just had this sort of like gambler in the back of his head yeah he had the swagger he yeah. had this like he had like a certain charm he yeah. had none of the charm in fact that sam kirk said he did <laughs> and once again <laughs> we're, we're dealing with a situation that annoys me that secret hideout and and uh red uh, bad robot which are essentially the same production company um seem to like not understand and if this sounds familiar it's because david mack uh who was a consultant on uh, prodigy and also uh, a star trek novelist had a very similar rant about how <laughs> they don't understand kirk because they like grab at all of the things like as sam as sam is describing him which i imagine your sibling would describe you in the worst way possible but like they grab onto this thing of like oh man he's like this like ladies man he bends the rules he breaks the rules and all this and it's like it's not that like in like kirk in the original series yes he bent rules from time to time but he was also like you know the stack of books with legs he was like the guy who had like so many commendations and medals that they had to like in court martial they had to like turn the computer off so it stopped saying all of his bullshit like he right. was very by the book mm-hmm. and he was for a long time he was very by the book and only on occasions he would really bend those rules or he would find ways to like still be in the the rules he doesn't say break the rules he says bend the rules right bends them constantly or something like that is what he says which like i I think that's pretty fair for kirk because he's always he's the thing about kirk is he's always looking for the third way He's always like, there's this way and this way. People present you with two options. This one's by the book. This one's not. And he comes Mm. up with some weird third way. And I think it's pretty close to bending the rules a lot of the time. Um, Now, you know, again, we were always talking about this, the original series. Some of this is impressions and feelings I have of it. When I have, I haven't sat down with a pen and paper and gone, how many episodes does he bend a rule? You know, right now, me either. But Uh. like, (laughs) (laughs) Um, but I, I still get that. I, I think that's a fair interpretation that he does bend rules a, a fair amount. It's yeah. just, but he also always comes through. And that's part of why you have a human in the chair. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Why it's not just regulations. And that's like the best of the admirals all understand that. And that's why they leave him in the chair is because he always has to make these hard decisions out there and, uh, mm-hmm. and then, you know, make these great actions. And uh, I just, I find this, I find this episode fascinating just on how it's comparing Kirk to Pike. And how it's like, Pike, I love Pike, but Pike yeah. is a little more by the book. I love Pike enough that I, uh, they could have just had Anson Mount put on a wig and play Kirk. I would have been happier. I would have been happier. <laughs> yeah. No, I hear that. <laughs> I honestly wish they'd let the guy who plays Sam play him. Cause I've thought he's been a, I've been like, this feels like Chris Pine's Kirk to me. Like yeah. he feels like a Kirk at least. Yeah. He feels like a Kirk's brother. And I thought they were going to do something to like, give him a little more gravitas and responsibility and throw and t- shave the mustache. And I thought that's what yeah. we were going to get. And 
We didn't. I, 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 I don't love this Kirk. I did. I enjoyed him as a foil for Pike. Like the whole like pushing him to be a little bit. But even in Balance of Terror, Kirk had that. You know, Kirk had yeah. his his soldiers around him uh, that are like some of them telling him like we have to fight this war. Like this is the Romulans. We have to kill them. You know. Yeah. yeah. They, uh, and and. And then Kirk had to make the decision, you know? Um, and in this, it's really interesting because almost everyone wants to attack, but Anson Mount is such a lover of peace and thinks that empathy is the way to go, that he goes with his own, with empathy. And it's like, yeah. that is the right decision 95% of the time. And it would it would have been if it hadn't been for that jackass sub-commander. Yeah. But what does this mean for... Uh, for Pike going forward, you know? Like, who is... Will this change the way that Pike acts? It has to. And it has to, like, everyone's, like, I've seen everyone pointing out that, like, see, he turned around and he didn't do the thing. So this is establishing that the future, the ending won't change. And I'm like, no, because Kirk is coming in season two, and we see him with Kirk's file up at the end of this episode. So he's obviously, like, interested in Kirk now. Like, so we're, like, in the original canon. Right. We're, you know, they met when, when Pike pass the enterprise off to him also in canon in the original canon i should say uh you know pike had left the enterprise still able-bodied yeah to become captain of the fleet so th- there's a lot of like little weird things they're doing here they are changing stuff yeah i mean and that's I fine mean, here's the thing so i've been really down on your idea that like this is about even possibly about when you when you interpret episodes in that way that like oh this is about them thinking that th- whether this is going to be a real in a universe or not i've been like no nah, they're not even thinking about that but then i started thinking about it when i was watching this episode and like this show from the beginning is about whether pike is going to try to change things or not you know yeah. what i mean like that's what the show is about and like all the other little sort of conspiracies about like the girl would telling the story or like this sort of thing. <laughs> it's not I, a conspiracy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it looks like foreshadowing. Yeah, see, like a uh, conspiracy writers, the foreshadowing is writer for conspiracy. Um, no, uh, it, you know, like, <laughs> <laughs> the title was owed to chrysanthemums. <laughs> chrysanthemums are the flower used at funerals. <laughs> well, like the, the, all these things that, that you see um happening i just i i haven't seen it but then i started really just giving a thought to like what his overall arc is and i mean this episode we see it is possible for him to change it you know he changed it uh and this is the future that he got because of that and so Mm -hmm. i'm really uh and now i'm more than ever sitting here thinking like okay so okay that's that's what he did what if he did all the same things Except he re- got off the Enterprise a year earlier. You know what I mean? Like he like le- like do all that and yeah. then leave the Enterprise, and then Kirk gets in the chair, and then he, you know it all happens the way it's supposed to. Except maybe you can escape with your life. But I think he, the lesson he's probably going to learn is that like I can't do that. I actually, there's a beautiful moment in this episode. There are many. There's yeah, oh, there are I many. totally agree. But one of my favorites was when he he gets back to his original timeline. A little, little, little original era, I should say. He decides not to write the letter. He says, you know, uh, dance, dance with the devil in the pale moonlight vibes when he says delete log, you know, or delete entry. Uh-huh. And then he walks out on the ship and they had that, just they went in a way I did not expect, which was the happy little song about like, I'm so happy to meet you. I'm so happy to be with you and all this stuff. Yeah, they're making memories. Yeah. Yeah. That is... It's really good. That's a that was a beautiful moment when he's like walking on through. I thought I was gonna end it there, and I was gonna like I was almost in tears because I'm thinking about. He was like, like knows he has six years left, seven years left, and he's just like, well, you know what? This is gonna be my family. This is gonna be the life I get to live while I'm able bodied, and I'm gonna enjoy it, and I'm gonna make memories with my friends and family here, mm-hmm. and uh, and I'm and 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 I'm gonna live this life and do what I have to do, do my duty. So that the future can be protected, and I loved that as an ending. But yeah. then we know Una is getting arrested, yeah. And like in this future, Una is still in a penal colony, right? You know, like I don't yeah. know that he's going to want to let that stand. There are certain no. things about this future that he doesn't. That's really the only thing. That thing about the future he doesn't like. Um, well, obviously, and his whole disfigurement well, thing. Ortega's is a piece of shit in the future. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Dave, are you just talking about in the 22nd century in general? <laughs> no, no, no. 23rd well, yeah, century. But, <laughs> no, like she, she goes from being like an annoying chipper person to like a racist. Like they just turn her into styles from Balance of Terror. But like, I'm not just mad at her. I'm just like, dude, what happened? Because you were like, she was already, she was like pissed at Spock. Like what did Spock do? It was was it Spock that like figured out that Uno was genetically enhanced and he had to tell somebody? Like, did somebody like did a superior figure it out and come to him and ask him and he didn't lie because he's Vulcan? Like, what happened? Did he was he responsible for Uno being thrown in jail? That was, could make. Was sense. there something else? Was did something else happen between her and Spock that we will see subsequently that turned her against him because she was angry with him? Before we, they ever even saw what the Romulans mm. looked like. Okay. And we've already seen this sort of like bigoted side from her. Yeah. In reference to the Gorn. Uh, but, you know, now seeing it here as well, like with Vulcans and Romulans, you're just like, shit, you turned on Spock quick and you've been serving with this dude for years. He had to have done something to piss right. you off before. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's very possible that things have, uh, Things have dematerialized in their relationship up till now, and then she sees the Romulans look the same, and then she doesn't trust him. Uh, that's yeah. interesting. That's an interesting point. It makes me really wonder what they're doing here, man. Like, I, I for the first time, I'm joining you in this conspiracy theory. Uh, <laughs> it's not a conspiracy. <laughs> look, man. <laughs> even if you want to take like throw away all those other times in Star Trek history, they went back in time. Man, the, they found a free, they, the Borg were in Enterprise. They found a Borg ship on Enterprise. That's going to up the technology from reverse engineering 24th century Borg technology uh, on the the sh- the series Star Trek Enterprise. So, this I mean, is all. This yeah, but is, I thought that was is, like a thing that always happened. You thought it was, but it wasn't. <laughs> right. Well, like, but it, why? Why wasn't it? Like, I, yeah, I mean, like, it could be. You, you mm-hmm. could be right. They could make use that as a way to change it. They could use a number of things and make it the the thing that changes the future. But um, I, yeah. th- I think we're going to get a chance for, to see the future is going to change because Pike makes a decision, and that's what's most yeah. interesting in all these characters making decisions that we understand the we and they understand the consequences of is what this stuff is all about. And I, yeah. I, I love the idea that they're really setting up this narrative for Pike to have to make these decisions, you know? Yeah, no, I, I, I'm, I'm very curious because one of the, like I've said, I think last week, one of my biggest problems with this show is that you kind of know where everybody winds up and it takes a lot of the stakes out of it for me. So if, you know, to me, if we're going this far with it, I want to go the rest of the way and literally just not know, like, Mm -hmm. how are we changing things? Yeah. Like, because you could always make the case that all the old stuff that we watched and we know the ending of was always meant to happen that way. And then time changes because of temporal wars or Borg or whatever, whatever the hell you want to say. Sure. And let's write a new, a new chapter, a new version of this. It's one of the things I like about comic books and why I don't mind that comic books keep like, retcon yeah and, and they, they they retcon things and I, i'm fine with that too in general um i, I do love i love a contiguous universe because i like to know that the guy i'm meeting is the guy from the other story and understand that that's yeah like their backstory is their backstory but you know yeah. the, the the thing they can do here is like have some of those things happen where you just know the character of pike and you know the character of kirk mm-hmm. and you know the character of spock like in this this episode i agree with you i don't love this portrayal of kirk but yeah it's still like, it's still Kirk and it's still like a chance to see what he's like in this situation. You know what I mean? And it, it killed me because every time he came on, they did the, the little Star Trek fanfare. And I was like, look, man, you can, you can throw me a plate and tell me it's a, it's a freaking Chalupa Supreme. Mm-hmm. But if it's a turd in a tortilla, I'm still not going to eat it. Like, it's, like you can fanfare all you want. I don't I, That's not Kirk to me. Like, right. You, but, you know, I do have hope because Paul Wesley was on uh, the little after show they do. And mm-hmm. He was saying that he did play it very differently because this is an alternate Kirk who hasn't had the benefit of wisdom from Bones and Spock. Mm. So he has been shaped a little differently. 
And by the idea with Bounce Terror, that wasn't very deep into their journey together no, anyway, right? Especially not if it was six months. But yeah, exactly. But uh, you know, if we're talking about like he, because he says what he has said was that when he comes back in season two, he'll be much closer to original Kirk. Hmm. Which, since it's secret hideout, I'm pretty sure that means he'll just be like running around with a hard on, trying to, <laughs> trying to get with every woman. He sees and eating uh, an apple, you know, because wisdom. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, it's it's just overall just a fun episode. It was fun to go back and watch some of uh, Balance of Terror after watching this and see how many lines they just cop directly from that episode and things. It was yeah. really a good time. Um, so I, I I just you know getting a chance to relive an, a classic Star Trek episode. We we even talked about that. We talked about last week how well if they if they see the Romulans, we're not going to get to see them because we can't see them for another however right. many years. But I did not expect this time jump. I did not expect this alternate reality. I just it was it was it blew my expectations of the finale away. I really liked it a lot. When we got that first shot, that first photo of Captain Kirk on a bridge. Uh, I did call it about halfway because I thought they were going to, I said they were going to do a time jump where we see Kirk as the captain of the enterprise and then like do like a flashback to something that happened before. Mm. But I, so I kind of called it right. Ha- about halfway. Yeah. Um, of course he was captain of the Farragut mm-hmm. and, uh, which was the ship he served on, uh, before the Enterprise, and the, as mentioned in Obsession, and they even did a little, neat little call back to Obsession, where he was like getting onto Chris uh, Pike for uh, hesitating for a split second, you know, and that was like his whole thing in Obsession uh, from a, a thing that happened on the Farragut where he didn't he hesitated, yeah, and, and uh, didn't the whole ship uh, get destroyed or something, or like a half the ship or something like that. A bunch of people died. Yeah. There was like on a planet. I remember they, they yeah. wrote it in the, uh, ashes of Eden book. <laughs> that's how, <laughs> yeah. that's how I remember that little bit of Canon. And I, I liked it. I, I thought it was fun. Like there, there's a bit where he's talking to, there are, there's so many like great bits, like that. I just like pushing past my, displeasure with with the, the actor playing kirk i liked a lot of the stuff uh that he was doing that that the character was doing i liked his conversation with pike at the end where he was like talking about his dad and his how his dad served on the kelvin before mm-hmm. moving to tarsus four and you can barely hear it yeah. you have to read like literally listen where he says before moving to tarsus four and that's from conscious of the king when you looked at kirk's file under training yeah. They said he had hand to hand combat, and part of his training was um, he witnessed the massacre at Tarsus IV uh, that Governor Kodos uh, instigated. Um, I, I like those little nods. I really yeah. like yeah, uh, yeah. all of that that stuff. Yeah. Um, I think I love I, everything about this episode except for the, the Kirk trail. Like, I really love everything. Yeah, me too. I like how it's written really, really well, and it, it's got me. Really curious about the future with Una uh, and, and the and the future of Pike making his decision. But like, yeah, yeah, I just the, the only thing is the bummer is I don't think the Kirk trail yeah. works, you know, I mean, I loved that we heard Scotty. Yeah, <laughs> that was funny. They didn't show him because they're like, yeah, we might want to pick an actor at some point, you know, <laughs> Yeah, I really enjoyed that when he gets back to his timeline and he's talking to Spock. And Spock kind of figures out, like, oh, something bad happened to me. Yeah. Oh, man. Okay. So, he's like, I feel as if I owe you a debt, you know? And that perfectly, like, plays into the menagerie when, you know, Spock is like, no. No, my old friend isn't going to be, like, in you know, stuck in this wheelchair, booping and beeping at us. I'm going to take his ass. <laughs> To the uh, to the, sa- the the sandwiches and cum and horse riding planet. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it really does, it really does. It works, man. I I, I like it a lot, and I, I love that part. I love the so emotional. Um, seeing Spock thank him for yeah. for when he realizes he's like <laughs> someone you know, and then he's like. 
I have a feeling I owe you a debt of thanks or whatever. It's just, it's just yeah, really, yeah. really good. Mm. Yeah, man. It, that was, that was really, really solid. So yeah, super interested to see what happens uh, in season two and how the Una situation plays out. And I kind of feel like they should just write her off the show, honestly, because she was, she was barely in this episode. She was like, barely, like not, was she not even in the episode previous? Like they've kind of just kept writing her out. They've kept her away from a few episodes, but I, I really like Una a lot. And I know that, he, that Pike cares about Una a lot. So I like her, but I want her to be around. I don't want to just like, well, sure. I have her not inexplicably not around. I hear you. I just think that like sometimes they write these stories and they just need to cut down the number of characters they're going to use in a certain episode. And I appreciate that. Honestly, I I think that one of the big mistakes shows can make is like, all right, we have to service every, every character, every episode because it's a ensemble show. I, I, I I don't mind that, you know, we're going to an ice planet. We only need six people. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, well, part of my, my issue is I feel like maybe she's busy. Maybe she's got something going on. Maybe contractually she's not supposed to be in as many. And they kind of used her to sell this show. Oh, gotcha. And I kind of feel like, you know, I would rather see her than Ortega's, you know? I, sure. <laughs> I, she's, she was a selling point for the show. And part of her, part of why we wanted Strange New Worlds in the first place was her chemistry with Anson Mount. Yeah. And she, we just never see him. Or never see mm-hmm. her. Not not, so a lot, like, not a lot. I kind of just feel like figure out some way to include her in every episode or most episodes or get rid of her. Yeah, because I do think they've included her in most episodes. I think it's only been like two that they've just like left her out. Um, mm-hmm. and, and even then, it's like she'll be at the beginning or something like that. There was the one with the ice yeah. planet. I don't know what if another one they've like left her out of. But I'd have to think about it. I, Maybe even rewatch it. And yeah, I yeah. don't have time for that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I think she's at least maybe been in every episode, but it's just uh, uh-huh. some, sometimes she's in it a lot and sometimes she's not. Um, but yeah, I hear you. I, I like their uh, chemistry a lot and I'd like to see them together, together more. Yeah. Oh, but going going back to uh, what you were talking about, buying into the conspiracy. Mm-hmm. Like, I thought it was really interesting how much they had older Pike, like, reiterating about like time travel having unintended consequences. Like every little thing you do changes something. Yeah. And I'm just like, man, they're, they're kind of just, I feel like they're hitting that, that note a few, like just too much a little bit. Like, Mm -hmm. like, Oh man, something. Yeah. I don't know if they're ever going to like bring it to a crescendo and actively say like, this is what has happened, mm-hmm. but it's certainly giving us enough leeway for our own head cannons for those of us who are stuck in the past. Yes. Yes. The, uh, like me, the, the, <laughs> the, 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 of the, um, I don't know. You're the Jot Vosh man. You're being driven mad by the, Oh, visions of the future that, okay. Are, are not to be real. Yeah. It took me a minute because I didn't remember that. The, that term, but isn't that the, that. Isn't that the Romulan group? It wasn't they the Jean Rosh in, in Picard? I think so. <laughs> I, don't <know. laughs> I don't know why. I know we've we've sat here and tried to come up with that before and couldn't. And in that moment, yeah. I immediately went to Jean Vosh, like immediately. So maybe I'm wrong. Who are the people who uh, who speak truth? Which Romulans are that? Um, that is Elnor's people. <laughs> yeah, I know, but you, you, you had a, what's their name? Kawat Malat, was that That's right? That's it, Kawat Malat. Okay. All right, sorry. <laughs> Man, it, bring me all this new Star Trek, start giving me new terms to remember and shit. Yeah. I, can't, I, can't I feel like it. they brought Kawat Malat into Discovery just so we'd remember the term. <laughs> I, I have to. I have to bring this up. I have to bring this up because we we're always joking about how they kill off aliens who are like super hard to make Uh and they went out of their way. Like in Picard, they mentioned that the Romulans with ridges were from the North. The Romulans without ridges are from the South. Cool. So in the original series, you would assume those Romulans on that ship would be from the South, but we see them here and they've got like, they've got the bumps. They've got the ridges. So I'm like, y'all went out y'all's way to make them more expensive. <laughs> well, it's because they're a one-off. They're like, well, we only got to do these guys <laughs> one time. Especially when it would thematically like make more sense for them to look exactly like Vulcans. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah totally. Was, totally. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, weird. You're right. That is absolutely weird. It's a little bizarre. I will say, in the original series, looking back at that episode, a lot of the Romulans walking around the ship have big helmets over their head. To save money. Right. <laughs> oh, wait. In the original series, they didn't have the ridges, though. Well, no, they didn't have the ridges. Right. But they had helmets covering their heads. So I was saying right. they might have ridges under. Right. Like in the original. In well, they Terror. might. But yeah. the Romulan commander and the subcommander right, didn't. I know. Um, but yeah, on the original series, they put those helmets on because it was cheaper to do that than the ears and the eyebrows. Right, 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 right. Yeah. When I saw them walking around with those helmets, I was like, maybe those are the ones from the South. <laughs> or the North. The or North. Whatever. It would be the North. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we, we do have some feedback from Stu. Would you like to do that? Hey, Stu. Yeah. Let me, let's, let's hit it. Uh, St- hit Stu it. says, I'm seeing double. <laughs> Four Pikes. And he says, I'm Christopher Pike. I can turn leftover spaghetti into a cool new meal to impress my fuck buddy instead of just using a, repl- a replicator like a regular person. Uh, that is not a new meal. That is a very standard uh, dish that people do to have to use uh, on leftover spaghetti. So that's like a super old. I knew about it. I was like, oh, yeah, I've never I'd never seen it, but it looked good. Yeah, it does look good. Sounded tasty. He says, oh, Mott, not Mott. I was like, he doesn't even look Bolian. Though I suppose it would be entertaining <laughs> to see Pike try to convince him that being a barber is a much cooler profession to get into. <laughs> I'd, 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 yeah. That'd be great. Uh, Mott's dad has the perfect ed- a head shape for a new egghead in a Batman project. Make him a serial killer who murders his victims in the ways you can cook eggs. Fried, boiled, poached, scrambled. <laughs> I would do that. Sounds like a good Batman villain. That's what you have to do. You have to go like the Matt Reeves, Chris Nolan way. Like as he's like scrambling some poor victim. He's like, excellent. <laughs> um, <laughs> and for some reason, the serial killer's... Uh, kitchen is always just like disgusting and gritty and gross and they only have like they can't even see because they've only got like one incandescent bulb oh yeah that's like flickering yep like absolutely serial killing is like hard work you've got to have like better equipment than that shit (laughs) (laughs) actually it's actually like a really (laughs) funny idea it's not this would be really a gross concept but like for a horror movie like a serial killer Serial killers? Okay. Serial killers? Uh huh. But it's like the back office. And it kind of, like, in my brain, it's like a, um, like a, a cabin in the woods. Uh huh. Where, like, you, they have, like, a corporatized, they have corporatized serial killing. Uh huh. Because, like, see, all these serial killers, like, you know, pay for, like, a, it's kind of like a, what's that, what's a John Wick movie where they have the assassin club or whatever? Yeah. Except instead of the Assassin Hotel, it's like an office building where you go to get like serial killer supplies. Uh huh. <laughs> and like, they're like, well, you, they say there's like, they say there's like 500 active serial killers at any given time. They just never get caught. We are why that is. And like, <laughs> it's like uh-huh. a company that helps serial killers. Anyway, just a movie idea. Yeah. Feel free. Feel free to make it, Dave. <coughs> I have a different idea that I'm not willing to divulge right now, but it's not exactly similar, but. <laughs> it, the, okay i'll divulge my idea is a company that uh produces ce- like breakfast cereal but that's just a front they actually have like the world's greatest cereal killers <laughs> yeah <laughs> and i no, thought of good. it as a comic book that was just spelled cereal c-e-r-e-a-l killers yeah that could be good yeah. that, that that i mean combine the two ideas you got the like the, the storefront it, it looks like the the front uh-huh. is the cereal business you get inside it's like a like a you know a, a kidding out an arming of serial killers <laughs> yeah and then like it gets a little weird because like they're really just sent way too often to go kill like people who have a new idea for like a peanut butter cereal yeah <laughs> <laughs> like, that was our idea damn it <laughs> <laughs> well see my 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 thought was the uh the, the idea is that there's a serial killer's are more like paying for the service you know what i mean like uh-huh. it's like they're they're they're, they're the customer they are the customer yeah okay. <laughs> and like that because you know that's assassins like if you're hiring serial right. killers to kill people that's just assassins serial killers kill for the joy of it uh-huh. you know 
I, I just imagine like you know uh, it's, you know you, you think that you're gonna walk into like a dimly lit little incandescent bulb place but it's like everything's bright and like you're in a Kmart and they're about to murder you uh, uh-huh Never mind, Kmart was a bad example. <laughs> like, I love that you you use like a twenty year old reference too. Like, Kmart. <laughs> no, I know what the hell is a Kmart. Nobody knows what a Kmart is. Yeah, for some reason, K- Kmart's feel brighter to me. I don't like, know why. Blue light special on murder. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> it feels like a Best Buy. How about that? All right, they walk All in right. and it's like, yeah, and those, those are going away too at this point. But like, yeah, you go in it's like a Best Buy. Anyway. Bunch of asshole murderers in blue shirts who ignore you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Sorry, continue, Stu. Stu. Stu says, this is certainly a more interesting use of time travel than going back to present day Earth. It feels that- a little contrived, though, that what our Pike did in this scenario is apparently the same as what this future Pike did. You'd think there'd be some variations given the different circumstances and experiences the two would find themselves with. I also wish there had been a cutaway gag to the Pike version of space seed where he sends Khan to the brig immediately after learning his name <laughs> <laughs> yep uh, yeah that's great yep you know it's one of those things though like talking about the the experiences he has you know like, we like to feel like we grow and like oh we we learn we grow in seven years god I'd be a completely different person and to some degree that's true Mm -hmm. And again, I've been doing DC on screen for seven years and my wife or somebody like sometimes I'll flip on an old episode of DC on screen and start saying like, oh, I should have said that I should have done this. And then like a second later, I'll do it. So I'm like, I don't grow or learn. (laughs) Like my instincts are the same. Dick joke, dick joke, dick joke, dick joke. (laughs) Like that's uh, over and over. Yeah, you know, I, 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 there's certain things I feel <laughs> I've changed a lot in the last seven years. Yeah. I, I would, I would, I, I've, yeah, I've had some pretty massive life changes that uh, motivate me very differently. And even, even you know, you get, you get yourself into some therapy, man. You, you'll start like making different decisions on purpose. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, this is some shit I did wrong for a long time. I should do better at that. Uh huh. <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't I, know. This is we're in the United States. Therapy's too expensive. That's what I have Star Trek for. <laughs> <sighs> anyway, uh, Stu. <laughs> Stu says, wait, I thought Pike gave up command of the Enterprise to Kirk before he had his accident. See? Kirk should still be captain in this alternate future. Clearly, this alternate Pike chose not to give it up because he was planning to not get into the accident, so he continued being an active officer. That's right, nerds. Kirk's appearance in the show was result of an alternate time and doesn't violate canon at all. Cope. Wait until season two, buddy. <laughs> I think they're doing it. <laughs> <laughs> Stu says, what happened to Ortega's in this timeline to make her the Styles character from Balance of Terror? She is noticeably more serious. Haircut's still the same, though. Yeah, that was, that was the real tragedy. <laughs> that hair was the same. Like, what are you why doing? You, why you guys so mean to Ortegas? <laughs> Stu says the Romulan commander should have been played by James Frain without acknowledgement just to mirror Mark Leonard as the original actor. Uh, yeah, I have seen a lot of people say that. And I, I think that would have been fun, except for the fact that I also don't like James Frain to Sarek. Right. So, but it would have been funny. Like, and I did think this guy did a, at first I was a little like, oh, this dude doesn't seem like Mark Leonard at all. And then by, by the end of it, he sold me because like, he sounded so much like Mark Leonard. Right. When he was saying those lines. Yeah. I don't have a strong connection to Mark Leonard's portrayal of that character, but I really liked uh, this guy, whatever, whoever he was. Yeah. I just thought, I thought he added a lot of gravitas to the episode. It's really good. Yeah. He did a good job. Uh, Stu says, given how many species there are that look near indistinguishable from humans, it occurs to me that Romulans looking like Vulcans should not really be that big of a deal, though someone should be like, hey, both of you guys got your names from Roman mythology. What up with that? Um, (laughs) I always just took it as like, um, that's how we say their names. Yeah, those that was our bastardization of it. Like, right. Yeah, me too. Or like that's it. That's how you say their names in English or whatever. Right, right. I was a big fan though of uh, 
you know, uh, the Diane Dwayne books, the, like the Romulan way and stuff where we found, we know that their names are the Rihansu. They're right. from Shirahan. You know, I, I, I liked that a lot. And I, yeah, my sure. God, my God, my kingdom, all three buttons for, uh, for them to mention Rihansu and current Trek. Make it canon somewhere yeah. other than books. <laughs> The Romulan first officers get a load of this asshole look when Pike was making a case for a ceasefire cracked me up. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, but the commander was, uh, you know, digging it. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I I love this. Uh, I love the commander's like whole attitude in this episode, like really getting in there and just like wanting peace so bad. And yeah. him like doing his duty and pulling out with the ship so the rest yeah. of his fleet could destroy him as he like stands with his crew. Gah, killed yeah. me, man. Loved and it. you know, I, I always love that. I'm old enough to remember peace. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, that's good. Uh, Stu says, I'm sure alternate Spock would have still found a way to make his injuries sexy. I don't know about that. <laughs> I don't think he was okay, man. <laughs> <laughs> he was like, a gooier version of Deadpool. <laughs> Oof. Yeah. Lots of green blood out there. Yeah, man. Uh, Stu says, how is being witness to the massacre on Tarsus for training as Kirk's file lists it? Um, psychological training. Not really training though. <laughs> I mean, he might be, you know, he might've gone through some like, uh, you know, therapy that would have helped him uh, deal with that kind of thing better, you know? Well, like afterwards, but like the, yeah, I, I, I still makes a valid point. There. It might you be know, experience, like, you know. Yeah, experience more than training. Is it? Did it say? Did it say training or experience under that part? I, I guess it said training, but I guess that yeah, that's not really training. I, yeah, it's, it's not. But I'm trying. <laughs> God help me, I'm trying. Uh, he says, "Hey, don't look at me like that, Chris. I didn't arrest Una." Anyway, I thought this was a very strong season finale and wraps up the arc of Pike's feelings about his future. I don't think they're wrapped. Uh, also, like the latter end of Obi-Wan Kenobi, it certainly proved why jumping to conclusions about things at the start of a season can be pretty unwise. Nice cliffhanger, too. Can't wait for season two opener, which I assume will be titled The Measure of a Woman. <laughs> Thank you, Stu. That would be great. I'd love that. Yeah. I, I was on that Star Trek podcast last night and they pointed out that it was pretty much the this this season finale at the end was the same as the uh last lower deck season finale where they arrest uh Captain oh, Freeman. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> it's, it's like I don't know what we should do. Let's just do that again. <laughs> I how did they arrest why did they arrest Yeah, see this is what we're talking. This is what I was talking about a few weeks ago with Because like, they, the she was she was framed. There was some altered stuff with like uh Right for helping out the people who blew up the Yeah. Or for some for, reason for, I can't for giving weapons. Names. Yeah. The Packlid Packlids. Packlids, yeah. I did it. Um yeah. The yeah, she like supposedly blew up the Placket home world or something <laughs> because like they blew themselves up, yeah, and then she was framed for delivering the weapons or something like that. Yeah. But like, yeah, uh, it is, it is weird. And this was talking about a few uh, a while ago when I was talking about how, like, how is this Star Trek going to be remembered? And like, are is it going to just feel like it runs through us? You know, are we going to even remember? Because I'm, I, I, yeah, I'm like lower decks, what happened? Uh, and, and the same thing with, and then they can, there's so many things happening all at once. It's yeah. Like two main character, two main commanding officers have been arrested as, as the season finale. That's mm-hmm. kind of weird, but at the same time you're making so many shows. I don't know. It just feels like a lot is going on and it's not all tying into each other. And it's, yeah, it's, it, it, it feels like an abundance of Trek, which I love, mm-hmm. but I, I do feel like it, uh, can be so much that it's not going to have blast yeah that's the way i feel about marvel too right now though is that there's just so much it's just kind of running through me yeah no i get that i love marvel um i think the tv shows are really good background of the characters that are i think going to be more resonant in film a lot of the tv shows feel like set up for the movies wandavision felt that way a little bit um hawkeye feels that way 
Miss Marvel definitely feels that way, I feel yeah. like. But I love those shows, but like some of them don't really have I don't know. There's it's like this the story is not self contained and no. it doesn't feel like it really tells a whole thing. Like uh, I except for it's not all of them though. Moon Knight was freaking amazing and I thought it like landed the plane really well and I feel really good about that whole thing. Um but you know some of them feel more a little more like here's a little background on the character. Watch this for six hours, then you'll enjoy the movie a little more later. Mm-hmm. You know, <laughs> when Ms. Marvel shows up in the Marvels, you'll know who she is. <laughs> yeah. You know, there's a, I think I can't remember what he was doing. Maybe. Um, oh, Vincent Price. There was a um, Bill Hader was doing a Vincent Price impersonation on SNL. And uh, and Lord Michael's response was, I love this, but why now? <laughs> I, I i have that, that exact quote in my head for about half if not 75 percent of what i'm watching out of marvel these days like i love this but why now well like, i feel that way I with marvel care. partially because like i don't know what we don't know what's coming and i think it's deliberate they're keeping it from us they're like <laughs> they're leading up they've just got so many little threads started to so many mm-hmm. different classic marvel things yeah and it's like where's it going next yeah are we getting secret wars are we getting uh champions are we getting young avengers are we getting dark avengers are like all these storylines have started and it's like what where are they going first what is leading to the big thing is there going to be another 10-year arc like they did previously yeah we were talking about it uh have you seen Thor Love and Thunder yet? No, I haven't had a chance to. It's great, but there's like a ton of stuff on the cutting room floor. Probably it's a four hour long cut and Ooh. they cut it down to two hours. <laughs> Release um, the Watiti cut. Yeah, no, 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 there's a lot of that going on. Um, but like w- w- Watiti came out immediately and was like, I don't want to cut. Like, this is my cut, <laughs> which I know they have to say that. Yeah, but they, that's what they, Ashley yeah. said. Ashley said earlier on the cast station, hey, hey, he has to say that. Apparently, they just did some stuff that was like way too dark. The same thing happened with a uh, multiverse, uh, multiverse of madness. madness. Like, there's some really dark stuff that Except Raimi Except Sam Raimi didn't say, I don't want to cut. He was just like, oh, there was some great stuff I cut. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, they, they cut crazy stuff. Like, uh, apparently, there's like the Grand Master was in it. So they cut it. Yeah. Uh, oh gosh, some actress that I'm not I'm not com- coming to mind right now. But uh, there's a there's a big actress that was in it. Uh, we don't even know in a mystery role, and sh- they just cut her completely. Yeah. They had a uh, Etri, the uh, Peter Dinklage character from Endgame, yeah. was in it at one point, and he's just That's they awesome. cut him completely. Um, no, it's just, it's all on the cutting room floor, and it's like, dang, I, I, there's so many yeah. things they're they're talking about, and I went in like. And it's everything in it is good, but there's so many things they cut. I want to see it all. <laughs> yeah, the thing that I like heard that was in Multiverse of Madness, that was like the first scene. The that death was of just Mordo. Like, the, yes, the death of Mordo. Just like, yeah. oh, I needed that storyline wrapped up. I wanted mm-hmm. to see like that uh, that end credit come to fruition. And I feel like everybody, like all the real ones, knew that she was the villain anyway. I didn't need that like light twist at the beginning of her being the bad guy oh i i did i did not know she like i thought she was going to end up being the uh, spoiler alert for multiverse of madness guys uh i knew i knew that she was likely to end up being the bad guy uh-huh. of the movie but i didn't think it would start that way i thought it was going to be like she comes into the story they have to go into the multiverse for some reason and then when she gets out there the desire for, she gets a chance at her children again and the desire to save them like propels her into you know going all full scarlet witch but like her being the bad guy from the very beginning did not is not what i expected at all and like i loved i loved the that they held that back yeah no that would have been a a baller way to start the movie i would have been it would have that. oh uh, yeah that scene <laughs> i mean like they could have still had that surprise they could have had um yeah they could have had you know uh he show up but uh, the same way, same way he meets her in the little vineyard thing. And then when she uh, flips it all to red and then she shows the head, you know, yeah. it's just supposedly what was supposed to happen. She's supposed to have Mordo's head um, in that scene. And she, so she shows the head to the strange and then like it gives us a little flashback of what she did, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. I still could have had that scene. I, I am a good director 
and a good editor will cut great things if it makes the movie better. So like, Uh hopefully a lot of these cuts are being made because they make the movie better. Um, You can have an amazing scene, but if it doesn't flow right and it it slows the movie down too much or whatever. Um, But that's thing. That's what I was thinking about this. We talked about tonight on the MCU cast was like, both those movies are two hours long. Mm -hmm. Like, but they're so expansive and they have so much going on and they're still, they're really trying to get the run times down. It seems like, cause I think they don't want the run time creep where every solo movie has to be three hours long, you know, even yeah. though, but they're, they're so expansive. And they have so many different characters in them, but they're still keeping it at two hours. It feels so tight and kind of short. And, uh, I haven't hated that, but I, I do kind of miss things like I really wish grandmaster had been in, uh, love and thunder. Yeah. I really wish E tree had been in there. I don't like going to the theater anyway, mm-hmm. so uh, I'm somewhat thankful that uh, for my bladder that <laughs> I, I don't have to right. like only two there. hours. But uh, <laughs> but then for like th- you know my streaming habits, I'm like, oh no, dude, give me like an eight hour epic, like right. give me like yeah, an eight hour like thing. love and thunder with everybody. And, but for the record, I loved Multiverse of Madness. I know a lot of people shit on that, but I loved it. I thought it was fantastic. With the way they ended up editing together Love and Thunder, I could totally see them putting out like a an extended cut uh-huh. because there are certain things that sort of happen off screen. And I, I don't think, think it's, Marvel's ever put out an extended cut, have they? They they haven't. But this is one, especially since there's four hours of footage that they had, had edited together at one point. There's just certain uh-huh. scenes I would love to see. And I would not. I mean, we'll get it in deleted scenes, probably if nothing else. Yeah, they'll probably just make it a Disney Plus like anthology series or something. Yeah. Deleted yeah. scenes from Multiverse of Madness and Love and Thunder. Yeah, they could do that with Iron Man. They could do that with all of them. Just like mm-hmm. that would be dope, dude. Now I'm really loving that idea. Like Kevin Feige, listen to our show and take this idea. <laughs> Do an anthology series on Disney Plus that is just footage that you've already shot, like deleted scenes that don't contradict the canon of what's happened, and you can tell like little minor stories, like 15, 20 minutes long. It's like Disney Plus does that shit with Toy Story, where they just show these these little tiny little like stories, these little like snippets of like their reality or whatever. Yeah, but those are like written to be short. I I think pulling scenes out and calling them stories is a little different. I'd be interested to see if they could do it. Oh yeah, and like I said, the way they the way they end up with the cut of Love and Thunder, like there are some definitely some holes in what they showed that they could go show some scenes, and I would be mm-hmm. really interested. But I think what also happens is they they film scenes like let's say he's the God Butcher, right? So like Gore's the God Butcher, so uh-huh. he apparently had a scene with the Grand Master. What's he trying to do to the Grand Master if not murder him? <laughs> and it's very possible they like shot a scene where they were like. Yeah, go murder the Grandmaster, and then they later decided, you know what? We want to use Grandmaster differently. You know what I mean? It's like, it's very possible they just made other decisions that they wanted to do with the canon, you know? Thankfully, Joss Whedon was off of this of the project before Grandmaster came into it. Because, you know, there'd be a Grandmaster Vader joke. <laughs> True. <laughs> do, you, True. Do you remember that from Buffy versus oh, yeah. Dracula? <laughs> oh, yeah. Master Vader? the dark master Vader. um <laughs> so good okay guys Xander we are thrall yep it, the, there's a great episode i think it's like the first episode of season f- five i want to say four but maybe it might be uh, four um yeah might be four i i wanted to say four but then i was thinking four was the one where she's off in another city or something but is that well no that that's, was that's the first three. episode of season two that was the first episode of season two because when she kills the the um the master the main big bad guy yeah when she dies and then comes back she like she she did takes off like she, yeah okay yeah. you're right that's that's episode that's season two and she's a waitress okay. at the beginning of season two okay yeah I'm trying to I like want to say like Drac- Buffy versus Dracula was like the first episode of season four because we go through that whole episode and then she comes back home after that shenanery. And then there's the big cliffhanger of Dawn as we being in existence. And oh, we I like, thought that was or maybe she was season five. Maybe she, thought, maybe Dawn came to season five. Yeah. It's all blurred. It's all. Yeah. Four. <laughs> no, four. I think four was glory, right? No, four was the initiative. 
Four was the initiative. initiatives. Five yeah. was was glory. Uh, glory. Yeah. Six was the trio, and seven was uh, the first the, evil. The first evil. Yeah. Man, what a good show! Let's go. I hope you guys join us in the next episode of the Buffy Universe podcast. <laughs> um, we'll be slash back MCU. Soon. <laughs> yeah, slash slash whatever else. Uh, now we'll be back to talk about Star Trek. Actually, I don't know if we'll be back next week because we don't know if there's a show next week, right? We, uh, as far as I know, there is not a show, but I will start. I will be posting those. Uh, yeah. the interviews I did with Christiana. Yeah, you've got some really cool interviews coming up with our uh, our friend Christiana, who is going to be doing uh, her reviews as a uh, person watching Star Trek for the first time. Yeah, yeah, we uh, we have cool. an episode covering the original series and the animated series in one because she kind of she watched all that and uh, and now she's been blowing through the movies. So we've already done a an episode about the motion picture, and uh, we're recording the Wrath of Khan on Thursday. That's awesome. That's really yeah. Fun. I can't wait. To, I can't wait to hear them. Um, all right, guys, we'll be back soon on the Star Trek Universe podcast. Peace. Live long, prosper, show along true. Force be with you. Force be with you. My dick hurts. Always with the dick jokes. It fell asleep in this chair. It's not a joke, man. Thank you for listening to the Star Trek Universe Podcast, a Stranded Panda production. If you'd like to hear more from David C. Robertson, check out the DC On Screen Podcast or maladjusted.tv for his web videos. If you'd like to hear more from Matthew Carroll, check out the Marvel Cinematic Universe Podcast or listen to his music. Just search for Matthew Carroll anywhere you get music. 